glad you all are with us as we worship the Lord and sing to him and, and just sing about how we truly need him every day and every hour. And really, uh, that's part of what we're going to be looking at this morning. So I'd invite you to take your Bible and turn to Luke chapter 6. Luke 6 this morning as we uh, begin really a new section here in the Gospel of Luke. We took some time and spent looking at the naming of the apostles, and we looked at all the different apostles, who they were, some of their uh, distinctive character qualities, and and uh, one of the things we learned is uh, that the Lord uses all kinds of different people from different backgrounds and, and all these different things. We begin here in Luke 6, and we're really starting a, a series, and we're talking about kingdom living now. How are we supposed to live now that we are in the kingdom? So when we moved this past year, my uh, brother and sister-in-law said, hey, when you guys move, we, uh, when we were at your house last time, we noticed that your basketball hoop looked pretty awful. So uh, for Christmas this year, we want to we wanna buy you guys a, a new basketball hoop. And I thought, that's really cool. That's really great. And um, then I started thinking, man, I'm going to have to put that thing together. And I thought, oh, man. So he had already told me all the things. It took like 20 people to put this thing together. And, and they had to have some rocket scientists come and, <laughs> and assemble this thing. So we went and I, I picked it up just recently and uh, brought it home. And it sat in the garage for, oh, just a, a, a day or two. And I thought, man, I just don't want to put this thing together. You know, I just, I just, it had springs. I'm like, why does a basketball hoop have springs? But it had springs. It has all kinds of stuff. And I'm thinking, oh, I don't want to. And I'm sitting in there in, in my study, studying, and, and I heard this pounding. And I thought, Lord, please let that be Michael putting that basketball hoop together. Please, please, please. And I go out there, and there he is. He's putting it together. He has the instructions out. Uh, he was even using the instructions. Yes, using the instructions to put this thing together because there's no other way of putting this thing together apart from the instructions. And so as I saw that, I was thinking, you know what? That is very much like what Jesus is doing here. Jesus has taken the disciples. He's made them his apostles. And he says, you're going to go out and you're going to live and here is how you're going to live. You know, we all live. By the way, he got the whole thing up, set up. Great. It hasn't fallen down yet. But when it, if it does, I'll let you know. But nevertheless, we, we, we see we, we all live by a, a certain code of rules. We, we get instruction from somewhere. For some people, it's an ever-changing code of rules. It's a progressive code of rules, rules that change based upon uh, the times, based upon the philosophies that are being given in social media, whatever is popular. It may be that we gain it from academia or wherever, but we all learn to live according to a certain code of rules or laws. And so here Jesus is going to be teaching these newly minted apostles. He's going to be teaching them, listen, here's the instructions. You want to know how you're supposed to live in the kingdom? If you want to know how you're supposed to live in the kingdom, Jesus is going to teach them. And so really that's what we are going to see. This is the second uh, sermon that Luke records Luke records, of course, we looked at the first one back in Luke chapter 4, where he preaches from Isaiah 61, and we'll actually refer back to that. But really this morning, I want us to see the theme, if you're taking notes there, that despite financial circumstances, genuine followers of Jesus must find their hope and joy in Christ and his Kingdom. So as we look at kingdom living now, he's going to be talking about finances. Now, just to put your minds at ease, I'm not going to be asking for any money or anything like that. 
But what we're just going to look and see is that the financial status of people many times dictates how they live. It dictates how they think. It dictates how their attitudes are towards life. And Jesus is going to teach some things that are going to be completely on their head, so to speak. He's going to teach some things that you would would think it's the complete opposite, but it's not. And so we, we begin looking in verse 17 through 19. We see Jesus comes down and he is going to be teaching. First of all, I want us to notice that Jesus here is the king. We gain this from in verse 20 where Jesus is teaching them that their kingdom, that theirs is the kingdom of God. Now Jesus has already shown them in these verses prior to this that he is above all. Remember he had healed the man with the hand. Remember he had healed the paralytic man. He had healed the man with the demons. He, He had been healing and he was the Lord of the Sabbath. Remember that squabble that they had. He was uh, the Lord of all. And so in his kingdom, he is the king. And you know, one of the really cool things is if you're the king, you get to make the rules. You get to tell people how to live. You get to call the shots. Now I know that most of us like to think that we're the king or the queen, but nevertheless, there truly is one king and we just sang about him. And so here, this is Jesus and he is coming down now and he is going to teach the disciples how they are to live. Look at verse 17. It says, And he came down with them and stood on a level place. Now let's just stop right there for a moment. You're going to see a number of beatitudes and it's going to kind of reminisce you of what we see in Matthew chapter 5, which is known as the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is perhaps the most famous sermon. I mean, even politicians quote from that one. Uh, This is a very well-known text, but this is Luke's take on this sermon. Now, there are a lot of people who disagree. Is this the same exact sermon? that he preached on the mountain, or is this a, or is this a different one? We read here in, in Luke that he comes down on the level place. Many times this is referred to as the Sermon on the Plain. And so I personally think, and this is a personal thing, uh, I, I think that this is a different sermon. You know, uh, preachers don't always make up a new sermon every single time they speak. I remember there have been times where I've preached a sermon in church for church and then gone somewhere else and uh, maybe teaching at a, uh, at a Christian school or something and I preached in the chapel. Well, I would teach it a little differently. There are some things I would maybe add. There were some things that I might change depending on who the, who the group was that I would be speaking to. And so I think really that's what you have going on here. Jesus pronounces some woes in verse 24 through 26 that we're going to look at. Jesus, this whole section is, of course, shorter. And so I think that really what we have is we have Jesus teaching on the same topic, but rather he's just doing it in a different way. If it is the same exact sermon, it's no real big deal. Uh, we just are going to be able to look and see how does Luke present it. There are some differences, some things that Luke pulls off and doesn't uh, attest to. But as we go through and we look at this sermon on the plain, nevertheless, we see that Jesus is preaching to a group of people, a very specific audience. Notice that it says that he is there with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon. Now it says that he came down with them. So he's coming down with the apostles. Remember, he has just called them. He has just named them. He has given them a special place and a special job for them to do. So he is primarily, I think, speaking to them. He's also speaking to disciples who have been following him. These are the disciples who have been hearing Jesus. They have been healed. They have been walking with him. And uh, they are following what Jesus is teaching. 
But it wasn't just them. It was also a great multitude of people from all Jerusalem and Judea and all the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon. So this has the idea of the folks up north and these were the Gentiles primarily. So he has really what you could almost see as the church coming together early. You have the, the Jews, you have Gentiles, and they're all coming together and they're hearing the word that Jesus is teaching them. Notice, as a matter of fact, it explains why they came. They came, in verse 18, to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. I think that's important. They didn't come just to be healed. They came also to hear him. They came to hear him. And as you're going to see, the sermon that Jesus gives them, the teachings that he's going to give, are not just information. But it's stuff that you're supposed to take and you're supposed to actually go out and do so that when you make decisions, you can come back to these things and say, wait a minute, my philosophy of life, my worldview, so to speak, is, is telling me that this is how I'm supposed to live. That when I'm making decisions, when I'm seeking what God's will is, these are things that are supposed to greatly influence me because I'm no longer part of the world. I'm no longer part of that kingdom. I'm now part of the kingdom of God. And Jesus is the king. And so he, he's teaching them these things. They, they're hearing them. And it says, those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all the crowd sought to touch him. For power came out from him and healed them all. He was powerful. You recall how he had uh, touched the man with, the, with leprosy. And how the, the man who was leprous didn't make Jesus unclean, but Jesus made the leper clean. There's power in who Jesus touches. And so he's telling them here. He, he, he's showing them truly who he is. That he is the king. That in this kingdom, Jesus is the one who rules and reigns. Because nobody can do what he can do. And that's something that we really need to understand and we really need to put our faith and trust in. There are a lot of things that we can put our faith and trust in. But to put our faith and trust in Jesus, knowing that there's nobody that can do what he can do and that he is high and lifted up and above all, that is where our faith and trust must be. We see that Jesus here shows how he is the great Lord of all. As we already mentioned, there are all the, the passages preceding this where he, he is declaring himself to be God. He is showing that he indeed is the Lord. So much so in Luke 4.41, even the demons cried out, you are the son of God. The miracles and the healings would actually be the proof. They would be the proof. Do you get that? The proof that you should listen to what he says. You know, there are a lot of times that you may go to buy something or, uh, and what do you do? Sometimes people will look and say, well, I wonder, wonder what the reviews are on this product. Does it actually work? We do that when we're going uh, and we're staying in a hotel somewhere. And we always look at the reviews. Are there cockroaches in this place? What, what, what did they find? What did other people say about this place that we are staying? Sure, it only costs $14.95 to stay here, but what is going to be going on in this place? And so we look at the reviews, and you look at it, hey, look, it's brand new. Nobody's ever been, nobody's ever even stayed there yet. But is it clean? Right? You know, you're trying to find out these reviews, how, how were things going there? And so you'll trust them. You'll trust them because people have been there. And, and it's supposed to be kind of the proof that, okay, this, I, I can trust this. We can, we can go. We can buy this. We can, we can come here. Jesus has shown himself to be the Son of Man, the Lord of the Sabbath. He has proven himself to be reliable. And since he's proven himself, you can go and you need to follow him. Look at how he lives. Look at what he teaches. They need to hear and they need to do. 
So if you're taking notes, I hope you are. You can look in the first point there under letter one is to live out Christ's teachings. He's not just giving a lecture uh, on something that is really interesting, something that you might find fascinating. My kids uh, went to the library and they got these books. They got like 10 of them, these 5,000 interesting facts, right? And so they're just walking around constantly telling us, did you know? Did, did you know? Did you know? And then they're telling us some meaningless fact, which is actually really, really interesting. But I don't later on in my life think, boy, you know, I really should adjust how I'm doing this because of this fact. What, what we see here is we're to live out what Jesus is actually teaching us. We're to, to take it and we're to put it in our, our minds, put it in our hearts and say, Lord, help me to practice this. Leon Morris in this section said, throughout this teaching, throughout this sermon, we are reminded of what it means to be a disciple. It is more than fine words. It is a whole way of life. And that's what we're going to see, that as we make decisions in life, as we make uh, decisions on how we are to, in today's sermon, be financially responsible, we're going to see that being in the kingdom should impact how we live financially. So the kingdom is a kingdom of living, and we come with the king. These are going to be totally different, totally opposite of what most people think. Before we get to the next point, let me just put it this way. Most people, when they're young... If you say, when you grow up, what do you want to be? Most people do not grow up and say, I want to be poor. (laughs) Right? Most people don't say that. Most people don't say, I will be blessed if I am poor. That's, that's just our nature. The, we, we seem to think if, if I get stuff, if I have a status, if I have a, a bank account where I don't have to worry, then, then I will be happy. And so this is how it's, it's kingdom living is flipped around. And so it, Jesus is going to teach us, it doesn't matter what your financial status is. It, 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 it matters what your trust is in. And so let's look at number two, point number two. We're looking at verse 20, beginning here, where we see the poor should be happy. Now, I labeled it that, that they should be, because uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that they will be. But the poor should be happy. What you're going to find here is really fascinating. If you, if you read down, and I'm going to read through uh, a few of these verses, you'll see that Jesus gives four blessings the Beatitudes, and we'll talk about what that word means in just a moment. But he gives four blessings, but then he gives four woes, and they're exactly parallel with one another. Okay, So look in the text with me where he says, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom. Then you look down in verse 24, and it says, But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Go back to verse 21. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Look at verse 25. Woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. Go back to verse 21. The second part. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Go to verse 25 again. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. And then go to verse 22. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil. On account of the Son of Man, rejoice in that day and leap for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven. For so your fathers did to the prophets. Look at verse 26. But woe to you when all people speak well of you. For so their fathers did to the false prophets. And we're going to look at these and just see the, the difference. The, these really are, are turned upside down. You would think, boy, I really want people to think well of me. I want people to say good things about me. 
There are a lot of Christians, there are a lot of Christian leaders, I'm going to put it on the Christian leaders, who go out and say, well, the, the world, look, they're, they're looking down on us because we believe this. And if we just change this, then, then they will love us. I was in a meeting, has nothing to do with church, but I was in a meeting not too long ago, and we were discussing a certain issue, and uh, a number of the people s- stood up for exactly what God had said. It was very clear in his word, and one guy said, well, uh, you know, I-, I think that maybe we should just change this, um, and somebody said, well, you can't compromise the Bible, and he said, well, we compromise lots of other things in the Bible, and I thought, can you name one thing that you take that God has said, do not do this, and you do it, and it turns out okay? I, I, can't, I couldn't think of anything. Any time where you say, you know, if I just take what God has said clearly, do not do, and then you do it, and it turns out okay. It turns out good. It turns out better. It's always better to do exactly what God has clearly told us in his word. And so if your goal is to have people love you and to like you, he says, whoa, you better, you better be careful about that. You better, because in the kingdom, it's not about popularity. It's not about everybody loving you and saying really, really good things about you. Because you're going to have to change as culture changes, as ideas change. You, you need to stick with what the king says. So we go back up here and we're, we're talking, we'll talk about that later uh, in a couple of weeks, but we're looking here this morning just at the first one where he says, blessed are you who are poor for yours is the kingdom of God. These are again are known as the Beatitudes. It's, there are fewer here than in Matthew's gospel. But we note that it's the same word, blessed. The word blessed is a word that means happy, or it does mean blessed. It means the state of blessedness. You are blessed if this happens to you. You should be happy. You should rejoice. This is, should be the joy in your life. And really, we see that, again, this is the opposite of what most people think. Most people aren't thinking, boy, if I'm poor, I'm going to be happy. I'm going to rejoice. But if you follow a new way of living, if you follow a, the kingdom principles, we see that this is how we are supposed to live. Now notice that he says, blessed are you who are poor. Now he doesn't say the poor in general, does he? Pay very close attention to the text. It's one of the things that is very helpful when you just read through it carefully and allow the text to define exactly what's going on. Notice he says, blessed are you who are poor. The, word, the, the you comes actually from where it says, for yours is the kingdom. Okay, so he's speaking to the disciples. Notice who is he speaking to? He's speaking to his apostles. He's speaking to the people who are following him as disciples. So he's not saying, hey, listen, if you're out there in the world and you're poor, then guess what? You're in the kingdom. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, blessed are you who are my disciples, you who are following me, you who are living for me, and you are poor. Do you get that? That's a big difference. Because if you think about it for a second, money is a very powerful thing, isn't it? Isn't it? It's a, it's a very, it, it's so powerful, it gets you out of bed every morning. It's so powerful, it makes you go to school to learn and to be educated. It's so powerful, it causes you to carefully stop and think and ponder decisions you are going to make. It's a very powerful thing. And so what we see here is the disciples, or now the apostles, I would suspect they're thinking, wait a minute, I'm I'm following Jesus. I just had this great fishing business, and now it's gone. Jesus said, look, you may be poor, but don't worry, you're going to be blessed. You could see Levi or Matthew thinking, man, I just gave up that great government job and the incredible pension and all of this, but man, now, I mean, I'm, I'm following this guy out in the wilderness and, and how's this going to end? 
what's, what's going to happen to my 401k, right? What, I mean, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't fully understand everything that's happening. So he's thinking, he could be thinking, Jesus is the king. Jesus is talking about the kingdom. We're in Rome. What if he tries to take over Rome and it doesn't work out? And Jesus says, listen, if you're following me, if you're following me and you're poor, it's all right. Don't worry about it. You're in the kingdom. You are blessed. You should be happy. You should be happy and you can rejoice. See how that's totally different than how most people think. Now, when we talk about the rich and poor, the Bible talks a lot about that. In actuality, I think it basically in the end says this. I'm going to read down through some verses that you can jot down. But I basically think it, it, it indicates this. There are warnings to the poor and there are warnings to the rich. Because in the end, we're all going to die and stand before God. And at that time, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what power or position you are. You may have been a Supreme Court justice, but now you will stand in judgment. You may have been the president, but you will stand in judgment. You may have been on unemployment your entire life, but you will stand in judgment. The idea here is that one day the wealth doesn't really matter. What matters is our standing in the kingdom. Proverbs 22, verse 2 says, The rich and the poor meet together. The Lord is the maker of them all. That's what I was just talking about. The Lord's made them all. You're all going to stand. They, they meet together. It's not like you go to heaven or you're in the kingdom and there's the, there's, the, there's the nice part of town and then there's the poor part of town. Right? That's, that's not how it works. You, you may remember even... Uh, it gets flipped upside. Remember, Jesus teaches, and by the way, it's recorded in Luke, about Lazarus and the rich man. Lazarus the beggar goes to be with Christ or with the Lord. And, and the rich man is where? In hell. I mean, that, that's totally opposite of what most people would think. We see that riches and being poor are both blessings and a curse. Proverbs 20, uh, I'm sorry, Proverbs 30, verse 8 and 9. Listen to what he says. Give me neither poverty nor riches. That, that's, by the way, I think that's a pretty good prayer. Give, give me enough to sustain me in life, meet my needs. Here's why. Because this is what he says. Feed me with the food that is needful for me, lest I be fool and deny you and say, who is the Lord? You see that? That's the rich. He says, don't let me have too much. Because if I have too much, then I don't need to say, Lord, I need you. <laughs> Why? Because I have, I have a good bank account. I have people to, to help me out. I have connections. I have wealth. So where, where is the rich man's, where is the temptation? Let me put it that way. Where is the temptation for the rich man to, to put his hope in, in his wealth? But he also says, it, it's not like, okay, so then you should strive to be poor. Because he says this, or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of God. See, if I'm poor, then I don't have anything, and I might be tempted to not trust you and then thereby go out and steal and go against you and curse your name. Lord, why have you done this to me? So he says, Lord, just give me my daily bread. Just, just take care of me. That's what he's saying. This is kingdom finances. This is, this is the idea that this is how we're to live. You see, when the Lord blesses us with wealth, and I do have to just kind of say this, in, in our country, most of us would be considered wealthy. Very few folks are actually bona fide poor. But in Proverbs 10, verse 22, the blessing of the Lord makes rich, and he adds no sorrow with it. So he says, listen, the Lord blesses people and he gives people 
wealth. He gives them good things. And he gives us those things to enjoy. Everything that you have has come from God. You say, well, no, I, I studied really hard to get where I am. Really? Who made your brain? Who, who put you in this century? Who put you in this place to earn those credentials? I think about that. I'm like, you know, I didn't have to be born here. I could have been born somewhere else where I didn't have those opportunities. All of these things, everything we have comes from the Lord. It's all from Him. So never, never be like the pagan kings who rise up and say, look what I have built. Look what I have done. All the blessings. And so the Lord gives us these things, and he gives us these things to enjoy. You don't want to be like, uh, it would be ridiculous if, if on Christmas morning you woke up and you gave your child a, a gift, a really nice gift, and he said, well, no, I want to be pious and show that I don't really care. And you toss the, tosses the gift away and says, I'm going to show everybody how spiritual I am by being miserable on Christmas. You, you, as a parent, would be offended, right? It's ridiculous. If God gives you a blessing, if he gives you something, wealth or whatever in the world it is, and you look around and different people think of different things as wealth, right? You know, you just look around and you just see what people like to spend their money on and things they like to do or buy or their hobbies and things like that. You know, one person would hate it and another person would love it. It's just interesting. People are just interesting. And, and yet the Lord gives us these things and we're to enjoy him by giving thanks to him. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for giving this to me. Thank you for blessing us with this. Help us to use this for your glory. And when he takes it away, if he takes it away, you give him thanks for that. Because all comes from him. Now, just as another side note, just because people are poor doesn't mean they're spiritual. Doesn't mean they're in the kingdom. Some people are poor because they're lazy. Right? The Lord's not going to reward laziness. <clears throat> Proverbs 13, 4 says, The soul of the sluggard craves and gets nothing. See? He craves. Boy, I really, really want that. Really? You want that? Get up and work for it. Eh. Rather just watch TV or do whatever. The, the Lord doesn't reward that. that, that that's not, it's not like, oh, you don't want to work? You don't want to have a job? Well, come on in. You're in the kingdom. You're blessed. Live off the work of other people. He's not saying that. Sometimes it's uh, people who refuse. They're stubborn and they won't work. 2 Thessalonians 3.10 For even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. In other words, he's saying, listen, just because you don't want to work and you refuse to work doesn't mean that you get a pass. So being poor by itself is not a virtue. But rather, being poor because you serve Christ, that is a virtue. You see the difference? There, there, there's a difference here. People who are following Christ, his disciples. I remember talking with a pastor. Um, he was my pastor for a little while. And uh, just in the normal course of conversation, he had uh, told me, that uh, he was 55 years old before he was able to buy his first house. Imagine being 55 and you get your first starter home. I'm thinking, okay, so you get a 30-year loan. You're going to be 85? Most people wouldn't say, you know what, financially, that's the way to do it. Right? But, but he, he loved the Lord. He wanted to serve the Lord. And that's just the circumstance that he found himself in. And so he was happy. And you know, the Lord blessed him. The Lord really blessed him in those, in those later years. And boy, was he a generous man. You know, the Lord blesses us when we seek to serve him. Sometimes missionaries have to sell everything that they have go off, they sell all the things that they have, they, they take a few things, you know, so that they're clothed, and when they come back to the States or wherever they're from, they come back and they travel around, and many times, it, it, it's interesting, they're, they're traveling around in somebody else's vehicle. 
it's just interesting. Like, I don't even own a vehicle. You know, I don't, I don't own. Well, they're not poor. Maybe in the world's eyes, they're poor, but they can be truly happy, right? Why? Because of the kingdom. That's what we're talking about here. So, so as we look at this, we see there, there's this idea that in kingdom living, the finances, the money, that's not the end all be all. It's being in the kingdom, being part of Christ, following him, knowing him, walking in his ways and loving him. The poor have already been addressed in Jesus' first sermon. We see that in Luke, in, uh, Luke 4, 18, where he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. Now, I think what we actually have going on here, because Luke stops with that, blessed are the poor, Matthew says, quotes Jesus as saying, blessed are the poor in spirit. Now, we know what it's like to be poor physically, don't we? It's poor physically when you, you know, here comes a bill that's due, and then you look at your bank account, and this says $500, and this says $30, okay? That's poor, okay? <laughs> You're thinking, all right, I'm bankrupt of money, all right. In other words, I don't have enough to cover what is due. Here, what we see spiritually, that's what it is. I'm, if I'm spiritually bankrupt, if I'm spiritually poor, that means I don't have enough to cover what is due. I need someone else to come along and so, keeping with the illustration, to fill up my bank account. And that one is Jesus. That's who I need. I need him. So, so in my spiritual life, I need to depend on him. But as you see in verses 17 through 19, Jesus doesn't just care about us spiritually. He also cares about us physically, doesn't he? He cares about the people that he was healing. He was healing their, their wounds. He was touching them, curing their diseases. And isn't that the great promise that we have in the kingdom? What diseases will there be in the kingdom? None. There won't be any. Who, who, will, who will have to minister, you know, administer at the funerals in the kingdom? No one. Who will be the, the counselors that will have to help the people with the grief? In the kingdom. No one. There are a lot of people whose jobs are gone. Right? Because in the kingdom, Jesus makes all things right. And so we see when we are in the kingdom, we can be happy. That's why he can say, blessed are you who are poor. And I think he's not meaning either or. He's meaning both and. Both those who are poor because they serve me and also those who are poor in spirit. As Matthew says, I think Luke has to stand alone. Just as a side note, Luke has to stand alone. You can't read Luke and then say, oh, well, in order to get the true meaning of Luke, I have to see how Matthew finished it. That's why I think when Luke says, blessed are the poor, he means this, blessed are the poor who are following him, okay? So we see that as believers, those who are in the kingdom, we are called for this. And if you're taking notes here, you can fill this in. We are to live with contentment. We're to live with contentment. I get this. When you, when you flip over, Paul teaches this to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, 6 to 8. At the end of the poor, we're going to look here at 1 Timothy. And at the end of the rich, we're going to look at 1 Timothy, okay? So he, he says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Now, if you don't think he's talking about financial, he is. He's talking about financially. He's using the same terminology. He says, godliness with contentment is great gain. So I think about people who love the Lord. They don't have to be missionaries. They don't have to be in ministry. They are just people who just serve the Lord. And money is not their God. Money is not the goal. But being godly, that is the goal. That's what we have here. Here we see 
He says, godliness with contentment is great gain. And then he, then he quotes Job, right? Maybe Ecclesiastes, both, it's in both, where he says, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that we can take nothing out. You're not taking anything with you. Matter of fact, some of your stuff may, get, may end up going to people you don't even like. Think about that for a second. And you have no control over it. He says, so so don't, don't seek for that which perishes. Don't put your trust in those things that perish. Put your trust in things that matter, that are eternal. And so if you are poor here, that's okay. Be content. Be content. Now he's not, let me just pause. He's not saying, listen, don't, don't strive for, to get that promotion at work or something like that. But if you strive for that promotion at work and it takes away from your ministry or dampers things that will have kingdom influence, then I would say, boy, that's something that you really need to think about. That's something that you need to say, do I love the money or do I love the kingdom? See how that works? See how that influences? So he's not saying don't be diligent or, or don't work hard. But he's saying, be content. The Lord has placed us all in different circumstances. Be content with that. And he says, if we have food and clothing, and here it is, with these, be content. Thankfully, I look around. We all have clothing, (laughs) right? And uh, if we have food, look, you have a place to stay, food, you're good. Be content. Be content. But the contentment is in the kingdom. Because if you have Jesus, you are rich. Though you may be poor, you are rich. Now, I mentioned how these have a parallel. And the parallel for this is in the woe that we find in verse 24. So I wanted to look at that briefly so that we're kind of hitting back and forth. So verse 24 is the rich should be careful. The rich should be careful. Now, he doesn't condemn the rich at all. There are many rich people in the Bible. Abraham, Job, these folks had, had money. They had influence. And so here he just says you need to be careful. Just as the poor need to be careful... Not to despise the rich or to be lazy or to uh, make sure that everything is going the way it should be and to put their trust in God. The rich need to be careful as well. We see in verse 24. Notice that he says, But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Here in these verses, the woe isn't Woe to you, you better go and deplete your accounts so that now you are poor. That's not what he's saying. He says, woe as in be careful. Or he's saying, woe as in, it's kind of like saying uh, uh, um, a lament. Like, oh no, what a, what a waste. You know, you, you read about somebody who has so much promise in some area, it might be sports or academics or whatever, and they get messed up with something, and something happens to them. They made poor choices, and they lose out, and they say, what a waste. Oh, what a waste. That's what he's saying here. Because you got to remember, who made you poor, who made you rich? If God made you rich, he says, okay, I made you rich, I made you wealthy, but make sure you use it wisely. That's what he's saying here. He says, woe to you. Because the woe here is that it's easy to to default and put your confidence in that. In your wealth. It's easy to put your confidence in that influence. Now, you may be sitting here, let me just pause for a second. You may be sitting here and say, I don't have that problem. Okay? 
And most people don't. Most people don't have that problem. You're living paycheck to paycheck or whatever. And I understand what you mean. And, 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 and when that happens, you, we, we still need to sit back and say, wait a minute, what else might I be trusting in? So it's not just about finances, though it is. But what else are you trusting in? What are you putting your confidence in? You're putting your confidence in the fact that you know you can make things work out. You're putting your confidence and you know people who are going to help you out. You're putting your confidence in your relationships or whatever in the world it may be. You, you just have to step back and say, I'm just going to place my confidence in Christ. And so here, money was the source of their confidence and joy. And so Jesus says they have their consolation. Here they have it. They have their consolation. The word, the, the word for consolation is a Greek word, parakalesis. And you may have heard that word before. Um, para means come alongside. Kales uh, means to call. We, we get that word like a paramedic. What does a paramedic do? A paramedic is one who comes alongside you to help you when you have been in an accident, to, to help you to, to get you along, to get you through. And so he's saying uh, this. He's saying, you have had your comfort. You have had your consolation. Your spirits lifted, it literally means. In difficult times, you have looked to your wealth, you've looked to your money, your power, your influence, you've looked to these things to get you through instead of looking to the Lord to get you through. See, God wasn't their comfort, money was their comfort. Sometimes this word is actually used on receipts, meaning paid in full. You know? Why? Well, you don't have to worry about that bill anymore, right? Been paid. Paid in full, taken care of. You got the receipt, see it? And so here he says that we are called to do kingdom living differently. Remember what Paul taught the church at Philippi in chapter 4, verse 17, where he was teaching them about taking their resources and investing it. You may jot this verse down where Paul says that he, he remembered the church and he thanked them for the gift that they had sent because it was fruit, and here it is, that increases to their credit. He was thankful that they gave so that it would be an increase in their investment, in their eternal portfolio is what Jesus is teaching. You know, isn't it nice, you know, you get some money, and then you say, boy, I'm going to stick this away. And then you stick it away and you watch it grow. That 0.01% interest is just boosting your, 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 your bank account, right? And so what he's saying here is when you take your money and you invest it in kingdom living for the spread of the gospel, for the work of the ministry, it balloons and that increases to your account. And so it's to your credit, he says. Now you may jot this passage down. I'm going to look at just a, a verse or two through it. But James gives us a very important um, warning. Uh, a very important warning about money. And, and I believe in the Holy Spirit. I just believe that the Holy Spirit is going to work in your life. So however he uses this, uh, but it's, it's something that is very important. In James chapter 5, looking at verses 1 through 6, we're not going to read the whole thing. But he basically says this. He says, I'm going to give you who are, who are wealthy, I'm going to give you a warning. I'm going to give you a warning. And the warning is this. Um, he says, you have, first of all, you've gotten money that is not appropriate. You, the, because he talks about the, the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord. So you've not paid them fairly. You've not done this fairly. And so, first of all, there's that idea of being fair. But secondly, he talks about this idea that your riches, he says, you're going to weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. So there's judgment coming upon them. For your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. You see, that's the, the temporary 
of temporariness of riches. Riches only last for a little while. I mean, your, your garments get eaten by moths and, and um, your riches rot. He says, your gold and silver have corroded, verse 3, and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. And so notice that what he's saying here is there's a trial going on. The trial that is going on is you have a vast wealth. And he says, you didn't use it. You, you stored it up. You kept it back. And you didn't use it. And so this old, rotten wealth that you have, that you left on earth, that you could have used for the kingdom, that you could have used and you didn't, that in the last day, it will cry out against you. It's kind of like a trial, right? Here's the trial. And God says, all right, and our first witness, you know, here is Michael's 401k that he had $6.5 million in. And he comes up and he says, look, you know, you... You certainly could have adopted another kid. You certainly could have helped those children out there. You certainly could have helped to finance this mission endeavor. And you didn't. You wasted it. It's crying out for judgment against you. Or name whatever you want to name. You, you fill it in. But he says that you just got to be careful. Woe to you. I just think that we need to think this way a little bit more to allow ourselves to be kind of a little more radical like Jesus teaches. That it's okay to be poor for his kingdom's sake. Not only is it okay, but it is, it is good. Here they hoarded, here they spent it all on their selves. And it doesn't have to be this way. Some of, the, some of the meanest people I know are poor and some of the greatest people I know and most generous people I know are wealthy. And the opposite is true as well. So it, you can't just stick people in these categories. You just have to do what you know is right according to kingdom living. Notice I told you we'd go back to 1 Timothy chapter 6. In dealing with the rich, here's what he says. As for the rich in this present age, and I'm just being honest, I, I would take this to be, to be me, to be most of you, to those of us who, you know, we have stuff, we have things. As for the rich in this present age, charge, charge them not to be haughty. Charge them not to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. Do you see that? So he says, he's given you these things. He's given you these things to enjoy, but don't be prideful about it. Don't be haughty about it. Use it. Set your hope on God. So that's the final thing is to, to check your hope. If you're filling in the blanks, to check your hope. Check, go home. Think about it. Check. What, what is your hope really in? What is your focus really truly on? Jesus has called us to follow him. And whether we are rich or poor, financial status doesn't really matter. So I say this to you. Maybe you're here now and you're, you're struggling. You might be struggling financially even. But the reason you're struggling is because you're involved in kingdom work. Let me just encourage you to be joyful, to have joy. I mean, you, you may be struggling. You're, you're, it, it's difficult, but, but the Lord wants you to do these things. Man, just be encouraged. Be encouraged by what God is calling you to do. You're living for something and investing in something far greater be encouraged. That's what he says. You're following me. You're in the kingdom. You're poor. It's okay. Maybe you're not involved in that. Maybe you're not involved in that. And, and you have the resources and you should be. 
You should be more involved. And the Lord will lead you and guide you when you're truly dedicate to him truly how you should deal with that situation. And so we need to be content. We need to trust in the Lord. Our hope needs to be on him. Take advantages of the blessings that the Lord gives to us, but be wise with those things. And we're called to live in such a way that these are not just words, but that these are indeed ways that we are to live and we are to think. Happy are you, are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom. Let's pray. Lord, we confess to you that there are times of temptation where we don't find our hope in you. Rich or poor, middle class, doesn't matter, Lord. The temptations to not trust in you, to not be content, abound. We sin. We do things that are wrong. Lord, we pray that you forgive us. Lord, as a church, I just ask that you would help us to set our eyes on things that will not fade, where moth and rust will not eat or corrupt, where, Lord, we will set up an eternal reward. Lord, I believe these are written to your disciples, and so we need to find joy in what you have given us, contentment. And, Lord, I just pray that you will just help us to be people who, above all things, love you. Lord, I don't know the, really any situations of uh, people, by and large, those are private matters, and so Lord, you work in hearts, you work in my heart, I pray, I pray that you will use me for your kingdom, that we will be able to invest in your kingdom, and uh, just to be grateful. Lord, I thank you that though we are poor in spirit, we have nothing, that you are rich, and I do pray that if there's anybody here that does not know you as their king, as their Lord, that you would bring them into the kingdom today, that they would turn from their own bankruptcy, their own spiritual bankruptcy, and turn to you. Lord, you live the perfect life that we cannot, and you died the death we deserve, and you were raised on the third day, raised for our justification. So, Lord, we pray. We pray that you will bless us, that you will lead people to know you. Lord, I just pray that you will help us as a church to know you and to love you, Lord, and to truly walk in your ways and to be happy and find our hope in you. We pray this on the authority of your Son and through his will. And now, may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Lord bless you this afternoon.